It was the war, the great war, the war to end all wars, the war to make the world safe for democracy. And the, that's the way Seattle people thought about it. The great war would bring change and challenge to Seattle, but it would also be good for business. So the Boeing Company incorporated in 1916 and it incorporated intentionally to build for war. Everyone could see that the future of war was in the air. Similarly, the Skinner and Eddy Shipyard incorporated in 1916 too. And it employed 35,000 people at the high water mark and it built more ships than any other shipyard in the United States. Central Puget Sound is really militarized by this war. The Navy at the Bremerton Naval Shipyard um, is very present in everyday life here. More than 60,000 Washingtonians enlist to serve in the various branches of the military. Nationally, 2 million men volunteer and 2.8 million are drafted. An estimated 350,000 African Americans serve, along with Native Americans and others from communities of color. Women play a significant role in the war effort. Many don uniforms for the first time as part of support organizations. They serve as nurses on the Seattle home front and overseas. This was a helmet that my grandfather, uh, William Hazeltine, brought back from World War I. He picked it up on the battlefield. I think it was Verdun. Crosscut columnist Knut Berger was 10 years old when his grandfather gave him this German helmet as a birthday gift. I became interested in military history, partly because of his experiences in World War I. The helmet was among the trunk loads of souvenirs his grandfather brought back from the battlefields of France. Not only helmets and guns, uh, he brought back a bunch of grenades of different kinds, and years later we found out that some of them were live, at least one that had been displayed on the wall that I remember as a child. He kept a diary, he took a lot of photos when he was over there. William Ebenezer Hazeltine was in his 40s when he decided to join up to serve in World War I. My favorite picture of him is he's standing in a, I think it looks like it's next to a, a, a bombed out German pillbox or something, and he's, he's got one leg up and a big smile on his face, his helmet's on at a jaunty angle, and you can tell he's having a blast. He served in General John Pershing's American Expeditionary Force, putting to good use his skills as an engineer. His expertise was supply making sure that the army was supplied and, and figuring out how to supply it. He had absolutely zero doubts about, you know, was it a right, righteous war, <laughs> you know, who was on the right side, no qualms about fighting in it, you know, it was, a, it was a, a righteous cause as far as he was concerned. But not everyone felt the Great War was a righteous cause. On the Seattle home front, the Industrial Workers of the World, an international labor union known as the Wobblies, are vehemently against the war. They regarded it as a rich man's war for poor men to die in. So the Wobblies saw labor as an international phenomenon and the economic system as an international phenomenon to push back against. Through work stoppages and other actions, the Wobblies and their supporters interfere with the logging of spruce for airplanes and fur for shipbuilding. And the woods were filled with radical labor who poured sugar into gas tanks and spiked the trees and said, we're not going to participate in this military industrial complex. We're not going to harvest this timber for war. So they were tossed out, blacklisted, and their places were taken by men in uniform. In the waning days of the war, the Spanish influenza pandemic would hit Seattle. The outbreak would take the lives of millions worldwide. Seattle would be infected by a trainload of troops. In November of 1918, when the epidemic was really, really intense, if you were seen spitting on the sidewalk, you had to pay a $5 fine instantly. The schools were closed, churches, synagogues, temples were closed, public transportation was closed. 1,600 people did die in King County of influenza. 
Knut Berger's father was four years old when the epidemic hit here. In a memoir, he recalls how his mother was stricken with the virus. He remembers his father calling him in and his mother lying there really on her deathbed. And there was a great question as to whether she was going to survive the night the doctor was there. And he and his father kind of sat vigil with her. But he said, you know, she was alive the next morning and she survived. But the doctor did not. We discovered that he died of influenza just a couple of days later. My father was a doctor also. And, uh, and I think that was, uh, I think that you could tell in his oral history that that really affected him, that knowledge that this guy had sacrificed his life for his patients. The Great War ends as Germany formally surrenders on November 11th, 1918. In Seattle, there are parades and celebrations, but also the indelible memory of loss. More than 1,600 Washingtonians lost their lives, and many others were scarred by the conflict. I think the decade 1910 to 1920 is the most powerful and interesting decade in Seattle's history in the 20th century. And there's not an aspect of life you can look at that wasn't transformed. Watch City Stream Thursday nights at 7 on the Seattle Channel. Or get video on demand and podcasts anytime at seattlechannel.org.